BJ from Board Game Go. I've got my guest here, Pete McPherson, the designer of Tiny Towns. We've been talking about all these other spicy games, but the game we really need to talk about is your game, Tiny Towns. People have questions. They've been playing it. I've been playing it a bunch and actually got a chance to review it. I think you saw the review that I mm-hmm, posted yep. for it. So I like it. I, my wife told me to tell you this. Okay, she has never seen the show. She doesn't care one whit about Gumbo Live. And when I was walking up the stairs, she said, hey, who do you have on the show? And I said, Pete McPherson, the designer of Tiny Towns. Ooh, tell Pete <laughs> I love his game. Awesome. Now, that's pretty high that's praise because she doesn't like a lot of yeah. games. So wow. That's great. Cool. So tell us, uh, is this your first game that's ever been published? Yeah, this is my first published game design. Uh, AEG has treated me really well and just so happy with how everything came out. It really looks like the most deluxified version of Tiny Towns I could have imagined. So my early prototype way back when, I had wooden building meeples, but they looked a bit more like Catan meeples, just sort of basic in shape. And I was just hoping I could find a publisher that would put building meeples in the game, period. Um and I just love the way all the pieces look, especially when they're mixed together. You've got them nicely organized. I'm a bit more chaotic. I like a big, <laughs> colorful pile. Looks like a bunch of Fruit Loops. So, yeah. Oh, um, that is not, that is not, I'm going to have to get back to the picture, but keep going. Um, anyway, uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember where I was, where I was going with that. But anyway, AG has done an awesome production of there it. There we go. Um, yep. Um, yeah. So we got those chunky wooden pieces there and, uh, Really happy to have my first design published with AEG and to have it get the reception that it's gotten so far. Pete, so one of the things that people say when I brought it out, and I brought it to two game nights so far, and the first thing they notice is exactly what you said. Wow, look at the meeples. I mean, every one of the uh, different uh, buildings has a unique color and shape to the meeple, and the monuments are 3D from the standpoint that they rise above all the uh, the other meeples and really yeah. stand out. So. Is it you talked about how you were hoping for a publisher? Did the production come out how you saw it in your dreams? I I honestly never imagined the meeples would be this detailed the way they are. Um, I thought they were going to be a bit more basic. Like we've got the little doorways in there. That was a really nice touch by uh, um, that was from Josh Wood, the developer who actually designed the meeple shape. So he's responsible for all those oh, cool looking pieces. Doors. Yep, the doorways, that was his idea, and he chose the color palette and everything. I'm colorblind, so I let I let him do that and just made sure I could tell the colors apart. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, I just... Because that's something a lot of the viewers... In fact, we talk about it almost every week, it seems like, because some, some of the chat crew uh, do have trouble with it. Did the colors come out pretty well for you? Yeah, absolutely. The, I mean, the you can see the brown and the red right there. That red barn thing is actually the same shade of red as the cubes. That's super distinct for me. I hope it's super distinct for other colorblind people as well because there are different varieties of colorblindness. But there was one point actually when we got the cards back and I could not tell the red and brown apart, not not in certain lightings. And so I was like, Josh, we got to fix this because this is this is going to be tough for people. And then we did. So and people Melissa point out it's sort of Melissa. a funky. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead there, PJ. I was going to say Melissa from Melissa Singh says, hey, she loves the look, the colors and the size of the meeples. And the card art is lovely too. Touch on that. I don't know if you heard, Blue Peg, Pink Peg did a long, a long deep dive into it. And one of the things yep. that surprised Rob on play five, he had noticed the card art with all the cute furry little animals in it. Where did yep. that inspiration for the for the fact that it's not just a tiny town, which is what I expected when I when I heard about the game. I the, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll give you a little secret. It had been on my radar a long time. It was one of the games that we talked about on Punchboard Media and a game that looked just like something my wife and I would like to play. I just kind of had a gut feeling it would be something she wanted. But I didn't know about that aspect of the game. Where did that part come from? The idea that it's not just tiny towns, but it's tiny little animal towns. So I'll go way back to the beginning. I think in my my notes, when I first started, I've got a little game idea notebook. When I first started writing down ideas for for this game, I said, players are going to be building something in a four by four grid. Could be towns, could be anything. It's an abstract game. If you play it, you know, it's, it is pretty abstract. You've got the theme of forest creatures, but um, as they talked about on blue peg, pink peg, the theme doesn't come through a ton because, you know, you don't have little, little animals on your, on your board or anything like that. And it can be sort of hard to, to notice them. So uh, we were thinking about 
early on when I was developing with AEG, what what themes this game could have. We wanted it to be a town building game. There could have been tiny people living in it, and then we were thinking about you know, okay, if it's tiny people, what uh, is it going to be? Medieval Europe. We've got plenty of those already. Could it be like tiny? cells and little organelles and, and small organisms like that. What else could it be that's yeah. that's tiny? Um, there was one point when mushroom people was an idea that was floated. I'm not a big fan of mushrooms. In fact, I, I sort of have like a fungus phobia. I do not <laughs> like the mushroom people idea. Um, and then... No, um, I don't like I'm the honestly, mushroom idea. Yeah, I'm honestly not sure whether it was Josh Wood's idea or mine, but we started talking about tiny forest creatures um, I was a big fan of the the Dimwood Forest series by Avi. It's, uh, I guess, sort of akin to Redwall by Brian okay. Jacques, another book series I read. Yeah. Um, so I, I grew up reading books about animals that have this sort of civilized world. Um, and so that was a theme we, we went with. That was what was what was tiny about it. And yeah, the, the animals aren't on all the cards, so definitely possible. <laughs> I've had I've seen a few people pick up a card and go, wait a second, like, this is an animal game. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, they, and they aren't on every card. In fact, I don't. Th I mm -hmm. think on this one, that's one of the ones, one of the monuments that doesn't have a card. And then all of a sudden, you'll pick up a card, and there's like a little rabbit on there. It's and, it, and it's cute. Yeah. It's it's good looking art. But one of the first things that people always say when we throw them on there, it it they look at all these chunky wooden bits and all the colorful art in the cards, and then they start seeing the abstract nature of the puzzle because that's I mean, we call it what it is. It's a puzzle game, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And and so all of a sudden things start clicking for them. I still tell people that the first game they play, it's all about just figuring out how the board is going to work. The 16 mm -hmm. spaces and and what the cuz you have that cool little twist. You you put stuff on the board. This is one of the things uh chat crew out there. Uh, I'm not spoiling anything. When you when you put the stuff on the board, it seems like every other little abstract sagrada type uh, game and then you remove stuff and add one meeple on there. And that's yep. where everyone that's, that I've taught the game, do you have that same experience? Everyone that I've taught the game goes, oh, now yep. I see the game. And that's an unusual mm -hmm. twist. Where did that twist come from? Well, so as far as the, the resources glomming down to one space, that came, it kind of came from two places. So one was Minecraft and the recipes for creating all the different items in Minecraft Crafting. if you want to make it. A pickaxe, yeah. yeah, you have a three by three grid and you have to put a stick, a stick, and then whatever the material for your pickaxe is. And the first time I played Minecraft, I was like, oh my gosh, you could make so many different tools in this game. What a cool concept. I'd love to see it in a board game. And then another place it came from was 2048. The first time I played 2048, are you familiar with the app 2048? I don't know that. Um, well, it's also on a four by four grid. It was really popular back in 2013, 2014. Um, and you have numbers on this grid and you're trying to, you swipe the grid and make all the number blocks fall in one direction or the other. And if they're the same numbers, they glom into each other and double. So if you have two twos and they hit each other, they'll become two fours. And okay. you're trying to hit number 2048. So the first time I played that and swiped the screen and saw the number of blocks glom into each other, something clicked in my brain and I was like, oh, I'm gonna enjoy this puzzle. This is satisfying. And just like in tiny towns, your board really fills up quickly with junk and you can't get stuff in the right space. So somewhere between Minecraft and 204A is where the different build patterns glomming down into one space came from. That is that is pretty cool. Steve has lost control of the chat crew, by the way. There apparently there's mushroom puns because you mentioned the mushroom people. So <laughs> Steve, get control of those people. Enough with the, <laughs> enough with the mushroom puns. But uh Steve threw out one, he says itty bitty city. Interesting. Itty bitty city. Nice. Yeah. Interesting. And Jeremy, the geek, the game geek ninja, who by the way is a librarian over there in Alabama, he says, Yes, kids' books mentioned <laughs> on the gumbo. Listen, Steve, I mean uh Jeremy, he could talk books with you all. We may do another show called Book Gumbo Live, and we could you could do a whole hour on that, I'm sure, Pete. Oh yeah, easily. Jeremy the Game Geek Ninja says, Lilliputian, your luck. Is that is that your is that your city choice? That's an interesting one. So we, we're getting a lot of names for you here, Peter. We'll see which, <laughs> see which one you like better. So inspiration itself for the game. So you talked about how the mechanics kind of came and how the theme kind of came, but the game itself. Did you draw on any inspiration from any games you've played before or any designers that you particular admire, particularly admire? Um, 
In board games, not so much. Like I said, I think Minecraft and 2048 were the main influences there. There was also a word game that I, I play with my dad where you've got a, a five by five grid, each of you, and you take turns saying a letter that both people have to put in the grid and you try to make as many words as you can. So that's okay. sort of where that um, that's sort of where that element of all players are dealing with the same situation and you take turns choosing the resources comes from. For those who don't know, you take turns being the master builder and you've got this this wooden hammer meeple. And when you have that hammer, you name one of the five resources and everyone, including yourself, has to place it on your board, whether you want it or not. A lot of the times you don't, and you're just waiting for your turn when you have control of the hammer and you can say the thing that finally clears up the space on your board. Hey, you know, um, two, so, go ahead. Oh, well, one board game that, um, I mean, I, I would say Patchwork is probably an influence for this. I mean, you I can, can see, see the board that. looks... Yeah. Yeah, the board looks very much like an Agricola board. I love Agricola also, big Uwe Rosenberg fan. So it's got some of the Tetris puzzliness of Patrick, except that the Tetris shapes are constantly collapsing on themselves. That was a big game influence. I had the and, game and the fact much... that you decide which of the next three pieces are going to get picked, leaving the other pieces for your friend, that's that can kind of that that kind of makes the same agonizing, juicy decisions that you have to make whenever you're picking your resources in Tiny Towns. Right, the same sort of indirect player interaction, but you're still very much affecting each other's boards. I like tiny Emily's epic tiny life. epic town. <laughs> oh, yeah. there's another company <laughs> that says, "Dang it, we missed out on one." So tiny epic towns, yeah. <laughs> and and speaking of the size of the box, that could have almost fit that particular company's line, tiny epic towns, but maybe not yeah. not, not the kind of game they have. But yeah. Um, with, you were talking about all the different design elements of Patrick. I can kind of see it's not the same game as Patrick. It doesn't have really anything to do with it. But I can see where it's got some of those really tough decisions that you're trying to make. And that brings me to, to a point. If there's a devi divisive part of this game, Pete, you've read the commentary both ways. Is it a solitary game or does it have player interaction? You're the designer. Where do you, where mm -hmm. do you fall on that? So I would like to think that it is, it's, it's sort of both. It's kind of both because everyone has their own board. And at the end of the day, you've got your own little thing that you created, whether you messed it up and didn't do what you wanted or you did, you've got your own little town. Um, but I think it really depends on the group. It can be a very much heads down sort of game. You're all looking at your own thing and it comes to your turn and you just say that resource you need most. But I think it can also be very interactive with the right group. So it's been pretty interesting to read the BGG comments and reviews. And, and some people say it's another multiplayer solitaire game. And then other people say this game has too much take that for my tastes, which is <laughs> really interesting to me that both of those views can be out there. But I think with different groups, those can both be valid valid views. And if you're playing with the town hall variant where you're flipping cards from the deck to choose resources rather than players choosing them, then it truly is a non-interactive game except for a couple buildings that score based on what neighbors have. Um, it can be be very multiplayer uh, solitaire if you play with the town hall mode for sure. But I think in Master Builder it can be interactive and I, I like to think that that's where the strategy shines, not in getting the most points, but in in going for that awkward building that no one else wants so you can name tons of yellow and and flood everyone else's boards. So it's up the, to the group, I think. The more you play, and especially the more you play with the same group, I'm, I'm assuming you, you would agree with me, the more people get to people watch and board watch and start to yes. predict, oh, I, I've seen this pattern. I know where he's going. I'm not going to give that one. Oh, she wants yellow. Uh, she doesn't want red, and I need red. I can score points on my board. I'm going to call red every round. But I do notice that the larger play counts, the less control you have over your board, and you really it's harder to score big points, uh, but yep. it's also harder to mess with other people. The smaller boards, I, I've I've scored. I don't know if this is a good score to you or not, but I've scored in the 40s on, on oh, a yeah. smaller board with just two players. But that's because I every other round I'm controlling what's going on my board and I can really try mm -hmm. to maximize that. Now, when you're playing with two players, the other player is directly deciding what you're going to play every other round so they yep. can really control what's, what's putting on your board. I just find that the game gets progressively harder the more players are out there. Yeah, I would say so. It's, it's different. I mean, in a six-player game, it's really about survival. You just... <laughs> You're just trying to deal with all those nonsense resources flowing into your town. And one funny thing I saw emerge in a late playtest I'd never seen before. Players started negotiating unprompted. <laughs> someone said, someone oh, I like said, that. Yeah, they said, hold on. You're about to name a resource. I'm about to be out. 
if you say blue, I will name whatever you want for my next two turns as master builder. And the person said, deal. deal. Sounds like a deal. And I was just sort of like, what's going on? I've never seen this before. Absolutely allowed by my interpretation. Go for it if a group wants to do that. So so maybe that's what you have to do sometimes in those bigger player games. And occasionally I will say, you know, I'll, I'll say you need yellow. I'll say yellow if you say this thing on your turn. So. Interesting. We do play with, and I'm assuming, I can't remember if this is a variant or if this is the real rule. We always play where we hand out two monument cards and you get to pick the one yep. the one you want. That's official or mm -hmm. is that variant? Oh, no, that's official. I think okay. of that as sort of the, the main experience, but the first time you're teaching, um, as you know, you can play without the monuments and it won't oh. affect anything except no, no. You gotta maybe play the boards the will be a little bit more similar. No, you gotta I, play I with think so too, yeah. The monument. In <laughs> fact, my wife and I played enough games to where we have think we've either played or seen all the monuments so uh, we haven't mm -hmm. played with every single monument but we have played we've uh, we've seen both of the cards and had to pick them and played with yeah. uh, just about all the monuments so i i, I find the monuments important what what amazes me about the monuments is the fact that in some games it feels like by building the monument is so critical you have to focus on it right away leave space for it and play it and then you get the monument, I can't remember the name of it, you get the monument that says you don't score any points until all your buildings are on the board and you get that many points for how many buildings you already have on the board. And all of a sudden it's like, mm -hmm. wow, I can't finish this building out. I need to leave room yep. for it though. And if you don't leave room for it, oh man, you are, that's yep. five, six or seven points, which could be the difference. Oh, yeah. it's, yep. it's an evil game. It's an evil game. <laughs> Thank you, I think. <laughs> if there was one criticism, and I got to be fair, I don't have any criticism about the game, but Bradley uh, mentioned that early on in the game, if you don't know what's going on with that monument and you don't leave yourself room and, and you mess up your, your 16 spaces, man, the back half of the game is pretty bad. What I said that night is, great, let's set it up and play again because the whole game takes 25 minutes or 30 minutes. You know what I mean? It's not yeah. a game where if you mess up a grickle in the first couple of rounds, it could be a long night for you and you might be pretty bored. But yeah. in tiny towns, you just set it up again and you play again, right? Yep, absolutely. I'm mm -hmm. assuming that's and what a you're lot of going mistakes. For. Yeah, it's it's pretty quick playing. It says 45 minutes on the box, but really if you're playing a three player game and everyone's experienced, you'll be done in a half an hour or less, I would say. Um and you know some of those mistakes sometimes you can recover and sometimes you can't. Sometimes you put a blue in a place where it literally is impossible to construct anything and it's just going to be a dead spot. Um, so, and I still make those mistakes all the time. And so does Josh with the developer. We play test over Skype a lot. And so often we'll say, we'll say to the other person, oh man, you are not going to believe the error I just made. This right. is going to be a rough round. So it now, still happens. We did find, uh, a couple of times I've played without the caverns rule. Uh, I think that's the name of it. The cavern rule. The cavern rule. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And, and I have found that resources. it may be fun. It may not be fun with or without the cavern rule. My point is that. In every game, somebody's going to make that one mistake where you grab the resource and you and you put it down. And you go, "Oh man, I can't put that there." You know, you know, take it off, put it in the cavern, and and keep playing the game. You only have two slots for the cavern. And by the cavern yep. rule, we're talking about people is when somebody calls out a resource that you just can't use. If if you play the regular game and you put it down and you put it in the wrong spot, and everybody else has already played, you're stuck because you can't get rid of the resource. With the cavern rule, you've got two slots off the board that if you don't want to play a resource, you can just dump it off there and keep playing and not mess up your board. So I, I like that rule. It's a little bit more forgiving. Uh, and I think it keeps people in the game because somebody can really mess, mess you up and just oh, yeah. give you a resource that putting it down on the board you, you just can't do anything after that. And that's just no fun. So the ability to dump it off one and hope that the next person gives you a resource you can do, I, I think is a great rule. And I'm glad you uh, included it as a variant in the rules. Mm -hmm. Cool. Awesome. But did that come from personal experience or was that always in the game? Or was it more of, oh man, people are getting destroyed? That one was an idea that came from AEG um, to include as a variant to, to lessen the the punishing aspect of the game for first time players. And also you can play, if you have a, a group of mixed skill level, you can give new players the cavern variant and then not play with the cavern yourself. So oh. that was their idea with that. I think it was a great call. Uh, if you had to give one tip for new players, what would you say? What's, what's the one tip for somebody that's playing tiny towns for the first time? I would say the most important thing, and this is pretty much an always rule 
always keep your squares that don't have buildings in them in one group because as soon as you split that into two groups you're guaranteed going to have two empty spaces at the end of the game unless you have some special building to finagle out of it as you know the shed building can be placed in any empty square but yep. generally as soon as you split your board into two empty spaces you're going to be really restricted in what you can build um, and you will have two empty squares at the end of the game for two negative points so that, that is a good tip and that's Pete McPherson. We're talking tiny towns, and it's out from AEG right now. In fact, it's it's all over the place, and it's number two on. In fact, let me put that up. It's number two on the hotness on BGG right now. Congratulations! 